Uh, what I want to tell you is about some work that we have finished recently about uh, Young Mills model, uh, <laughs> about Young Mills models coupled to fermions. And uh, <clears throat> what we found, what we find is uh, something interesting enough that uh, that I'd like to share with you. That uh, at least at the level, at least at the emergent level, we find that there are certain super selection factors which uh, <coughs> could be, which we think can be interpreted as quantum phases. And in particular, one of the phases that we identify is a phase that has, uh, is well known for the case of SU3, the case of QCD, and was discovered by uh, Thomas Schaefer about 15 years ago, goes by the name of uh, spin color locked phase. <coughs> so uh, let, let me just, uh, let me just get till there. This is work that I have done with my student Mahul, and uh, uh, we uh, uh, put it up on the net last month. Okay, so <clears throat> what I'll just remind you is um, this is just a, a summary. So I'll remind you about what Yang Mills theory, pure Yang Mills theory is, and uh, I'll construct a Yang Mills uh, matrix models for Yang Mills. Uh, this matrix model has appeared uh, over, over, I would say, many years, perhaps now a couple of decades or more, but I'll pre present for you a, a, di a different way of deriving it. Uh, I'll show you what happens when you add in fermions, and <clears throat> the way I will quantize this model is by doing von Oppenheimer approximation. So I'm going to motivate for you that at least in a particular corner of the theory, von Oppenheimer approximation is the right way to look at this system, this quantum mechanical system. And uh, I'll show you what happens. In this approximation, you can actually calculate the energies of the fermions explicitly. And uh, if you do the born oppenheimer approximation carefully, you actually find that there are emergent effective potentials. This was something that was uh, discovered by Berry himself very soon after his, his discovery of Berry's phase. So these uh, effective potentials that arise uh, lead us to conjecture that there are these uh, emergent quantum phases. And uh, throughout this talk, of course, I will focus entirely on just the SU2 Yang Mills theory. I'll have a little bit to say about what happens to SU3 and SUN uh, Yang Mills theory at the end. Okay, <clears throat> so a very brief telegraphic review of Yang Mills theory. And uh, uh, I think uh, the vast majority of this audience, and maybe all of this, almost all, maybe all this audience is interested in this question about what are the physical states of Yang Mills Dirac theory. And uh, the, the reason, of course, why we are interested in this, of course, is uh, very well known. It has wide implications for questions of confinement, chiral symmetry breaking, color superconductivity, just to name a few. And even at zero temperature, QCD, which is Yang Mills theory, which is with uh, color SU3 coupled to fundamental quarks, has a wide variety of phases that it displays. This is a picture that you can get of the, in fact, this is a picture, open source picture, I think from the wiki page for Yang Mills. You can see that even at T equal to zero, there are, uh, if you look along this axis, there are a variety of phases that, uh, that we, uh, that we know to different degrees of confidence and certainty uh, as known to exist. Okay, so <clears throat> many of these phases have, are characterized by almost constant or constant chromoelectric or chromomagnetic fields and fermions also with almost constant density. What I want to describe, what we are going to try to describe is try to describe this phase structure by quantizing these spatially homogeneous degrees of freedom. And uh, in more precisely, what we are going to do is look at Young Mills theory on S3 cross R and restrict ourselves to the zero mode sector. So uh, we know that we know how to write the Young Mills theory, full Young Mills theory on S3 cross R. If you restrict yourself to configurations that don't depend on, on the uh, S3 coordinate, then that's, the, that's what I call the zero mode sector. And this is nothing but the uh, Young Mills Dirac matrix model. Okay, <clears throat> now for the case of SU2, there is a very interesting derivation, an intrinsic derivation, an interesting derivation that comes from um, uh, a work, uh, old work by Narsimhan and Ramadas. 
this they were interested in this model because they were interested in uh, discussing the problem of uh, that was pointed out by Gribov just a few years before that. And what Gribov noticed, and um, uh, well, uh, let me let me uh, rephrase, uh, let me paraphrase what Gribov no what what underlies Gribov's uh, uh, observation is that. Uh, uh, the gauge bundle of Yang Mills theory actually does not, is, a, is a topologically non trivial bundle. There are no global sections. So, Narasimhan and Ramdas, and a few months before that, maybe a year before that, Singer showed that the gauge bundle of, uh, of Yang Mills theory is twisted. Now, both Singer as well as Narasimhan and Ramdas used very different techniques. Uh, Singer used, uh, uh, looked at the full gauge bundle and had, uh, has much more formal arguments to prove that the gauge bundle is twisted. Uh, Narasimhan and Ramdas uh, came up with a, uh, with a, I would say, more rigorous argument. Sim uh, and I, I'll briefly tell you what that argument is. Their idea is that you look at a, a special subset of left invariant connections. And you pull this space of left invariant connections back to your spatial S3. They were interested in, they want to show, they were interested in looking at just the SU2 angles. But the point that they make, of course, holds for any SUN. Okay. Uh, so these uh, left invariant connections that they are looking at, they transform under uh, the global adjoint action, like I have written down. And uh, <coughs> the action of uh, this. Because it's the adjoint action, the, the adjoint group corresponding to S, which is SO3, the action of SO3 on the space of uh, connections M0 is free for all matrices that are of rank 2 or 3, but not matrices of rank 1. So they restricted their attention to matrices of rank 2 or 3, and uh, <coughs> this gives you a fiber bundle, SO3 with. Uh, uh, with SO3 as a structure group, and the base space, which is the space of all constant left invariant connections, as M0 mod SO3. And what they showed is that this bundle is twisted. Then they had a set of further arguments to show that uh, there is a natural sense in which this finite dimensional bundle sits intrinsically inside the full gauge bundle. Now, if this bundle is twisted, making it sit inside the full gauge bundle is not going to untwist it. Now, I'm of course so 3 the, fi uh, the fiber is uh, the structure group is so 3 and uh, the total space is m0 uh, so uh, uh, as i was saying their argument is of course the argument they had to do a certain that they argued that this bundle sits naturally inside the full gauge bundle and if uh, uh, the very virtue, by by the virtue of, uh, by virtue of the fact that this bundle is twisted, the, the full gauge bundle also necessarily has to be twisted. This was the gist of their argument. And uh, what is interesting is that as a byproduct of this, their construction, we we can use we we get for we get a nice. A matrix model for SU2. This two by these three by three matrices that you have simply correspond to uh, the matrix model that you write down on S3 cross R. You can do the same thing for SU3, and uh, you start off with a space uh, with a left invariant one form on SU3, the Morakatan form, and uh, <coughs> this then construct the most general left invariant. Form, which is take the Morakartan form and take the linear combination over uh, real numbers M, A, B. So the M's is are now, M is now an 8 by 8 matrix. Now there is this S3, the spatial S3, you ma map it diffeomorphically to an SU2 that is sitting inside SU3 and uh, basically just pull back this Morakartan form to this S3. The pullback gives you the gauge field on 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 our S three. Uh, okay, 
the pullback gives you the uh, gauge field on S3. And uh, these M's that I have uh, parameterize the submanifold of connections A. They have no spatial dependence. And in, some, in this sense, they are completely gauge fixed with respect to the small gauge transformation. The only gauge transformation, uh, gauge freedom that is left is uh, global gauge transformations. And these are the ones that are responsible for the Gribov problem. Now, in this case, for the case of SU3, uh, the global color acts on the vector potential via the adjoint action. So A goes to H, A, H inverse. Or equivalently, if you look, go back and look at M's, then uh, it's like multiplying M on the right by the adjoint matrix H. For the case of SU3, these M's are now 3 by 8 matrices. So this construction generalizes to uh, SUN. For the case of SUN, the this configuration space of the gauge theory is now the space of all 3 by n squared minus 1 matrices, all rectangular matrices of this type, quotiented by the adjoint action of SUN. You can see that the dimension of this space is 2 times n squared minus 1. And this is true generically, except that you have to be careful at where this uh, quotienting has fixed points. These fixed points actually will play an important role. As you, for the case of SU2, you will see that they play an important role in, uh, uh, they'll play an important role. So how do, you, how do I quantize this theory? Well, quantizing this theory is at least, it's very easy to say it out in words, which is that wave functions are basically just sections of vector bundles that you uh, construct on this on this manifold. And uh, you can choose them to transform according to whatever representation you like. For example, if you choose wave function, if you choose sections that transform according to the trivial representation, then these are colorless. These are wave functions, these are colorless states. If you choose them to accord to transform according to some non-trivial, uh, uh, if you choose them to transform non-trivially, then they ca carry correspondingly some color. These are, M's are, as I said earlier, are basically like constant gauge fields on S3. So perhaps this is the approximation that we can hope to use to capture the condensate dynamics of Young Mills theory. Yeah. Yes. Absolutely, absolutely. So, uh, uh, okay, sorry, finish your sentence because I, maybe I didn't. <laughs> yeah. Yes, uh, so, uh, so, so there is, there, are, there is some aspect of it for, there are many, uh, there are many aspects of the problem for which you will need the full field theory description. But I, I think that there are some aspects, at least in terms of characterizing the kinds of phases that you have, that you can capture from looking at just the, uh, the quantum structure of the zero modes. Ah, so I, when I write down the Lagrangian, uh, then we, the equations of motion will follow from the Lagrangian, which I will write down, which I will tell you in a minute, the Lagrangian. Okay, <clears throat> now, it, so if you, if I didn't have this, if I, if I just didn't, this is the Mora Kartan form. And M's are just, uh, 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 and so this is the most general left invariant uh, one form. And then you pull back the one form to S3, that gives you the gauge field. And you pull back the uh, structure, the, uh, what is it, the Morakartan, I'll show it to you in a minute. When you pull back the Morakartan equation, you get the F that corresponds to this gauge field. That's right. Yeah, that's right.
Okay, so um, uh, this is, uh, I, I mean, this is the uh, Hamiltonian for the full Yang Mills theory without any. Uh, um, uh, yes. Well, um, uh, the simplest definition of the statement that uh, that a, a fiber, uh, some particular bundle is twisted means that there is no global non-vanishing section. So, uh, what uh, Singer as well as Narasimhan and Ramdas showed is that is that uh, there is well they showed that the bundle is twisted. So this is the uh, I mean uh, we are not normally we don't normally think of Yang Mills theory. Uh, we are not used to thinking about it like this. But uh, if you take the space of all connections. Then you know that uh, uh, this is your A. Then you know that under gauge transformations, so there is a, but this G is G of X. So this is an infinite dimensional group. So there is a, there is a space of all connections. There is the there is the infinite dimensional group of all gauge transformations. The configuration space, which is the space of all gauge inequivalent gauge fields, is this. This itself is this is infinite dimensional space. This is an infinite dimensional group. The quotient is infinite dimensional. The quotient you write formally, saying that let me just write and see how far I can go, because that quotient actually has fixed points. So. In order to deal with the fixed points, you put conditions like uh, you look at gauge transformations that have particular fall off behavior at infinity and so on. So, um, sorry, what was the question? I, I don't know if I answered your question. Ah, no. So, so in general, you cannot, it is only for a certain class of, uh, of twisted bundles that you can have simple characterization as a churn number or a second churn number or some, some class that characterizes it which is which has uh, an, uh, which you can compute by integrating some uh, uh, some local form not all for, not all twisted bundles admit such uh, is a simple way of deciding whether the bundle is twisted So, um, uh, so uh, th this is our uh, Yang Mills Hamiltonian, which is the E squared plus, uh, uh, this is our E squared and B squared term. Notice that the E squared is sitting uh, next to the, uh, the, the coupling constant G is sitting uh, uh, next to the E squared, whereas next to the B squared, it is in the denominator. This is because uh, I, you write down the Lagrangian as 1 by G squared times F mu nu F mu nu. When you do the Legendre transformation, the E squared goes upstairs. Okay. Now, for my matrix model, the, the variables, the dynamical variables are the M's, and the M dot is the uh, canonical conjugate of, uh, of M. So, we, for the matrix model, we identify this as the chromoelectric field, and we quantize by uh, just demanding that. Uh, a commutator of m with pi is the delta function, and you uh, uh, you can generalize this to the SUN theory. So let me just quickly, yeah. You want me to go back? Yeah, yeah. That, that's uh, that's what I said in the last line. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Yeah. 
So um, I will show you uh, the things that we can do with our model. <laughs> what do you mean? How do you? What do you mean by right? Yes. Yes. Well, uh, I wouldn't say that. I mean, this is a this this matrix. This matrix actually is corresponds to the uh, zero mode of the gauge field on S3, and I'm quantizing the zero mode of the gauge field on S3. So I have to, I have to I, I have to I have to take it to the bitter or happy end, uh, and uh, uh, deal with the results. Well, then uh, maybe it doesn't. I don't know. I have to see the equation. You can tell just by looking that it doesn't correspond to. Okay, fine. So uh, since you since you bring up the issue of uh, numerical uh, uh, numerical work, um, this matrix model can be used to compute to to do numerical work because it's basically quantum mechanics. So recently we found that we on the dot reproduce the glue ball spectrum for SU two and SU three, absolutely on the dot. It, we fall so our our calculations are exact because they are exact in the sense that they are variational calculations. So they fa they fall well within the error bars of lattice. But uh, let me come to that later. Okay? So since you bring up uh, numerical work, I just want to I just wanted to put it out there. But uh, um, if you don't mind, I'll continue. <coughs> Okay, so uh, the matrix model that I'm going to be playing around with has uh, this Hamiltonian, which is G squared times E squared plus the potential V. Uh, the quantum version of this Hamiltonian is that uh, I just use, uh, I replace the pi by minus I del del M. Uh, this is my Hamiltonian. It acts on the Hilbert space with uh, uh, this scalar product. And uh, of course, I have to make sure that uh, I, um, my, the physical Hilbert space is made up of states that <coughs> are annihilated by the Gauss law. Okay. So um, from now on, I'm going to stick only to SU2. And for SU2, the physical rotations act from the left of the matrix, and gauge transformations act on the right. Uh, for SU2, the M matrix M is a 3 by 3 matrix, an arbitrary 3 by 3 real matrix, so not necessarily diagonalizable or, or anything. But uh, <clears throat> because it is a 3 by 3 matrix, it admits a very natural decomposition in terms of its singular values. So we can write it as R A S transpose, where R and S are orthogonal matrices, and A is a diagonal matrix with non negative entries, and you can choose to order them. Uh, in uh, what is it? In decreasing order, you can choose to order these. So, you, you, if you like, you can think of this M as being made up of a physical rotation R, a gauge transformation S, and non-compact gauge invariant variables A1, A2, A3. The rank of M is uh, so as, yeah. Let me finish my sentence. There, uh, as we know from the from singular value decomposition, the rank of M is simply the number of non-zero A's. Sorry. Uh, 
so right. if I take the full Young Mills theory on S3 crosser and restrict, um, restrict myself to those configurations which don't depend on the spatial coordinate of S3, yes, you do. Like I, uh, uh, maybe I was not clear enough. The reason why I gave this presentation is because this is a, a, an alternative derivation of the matrix model, where uh, which uh, people don't normally seem to know about. This is it. Yes, yes. Okay. Um, so I'm going to uh, uh, not, not, not say much more about the pure Yang Mills part because I want to add fermions. And as we know, realistic models have fermions, and that's why they make things interesting. They uh, typically you choose them to transform according to some representation of the gauge group. They could be adjoint fermions or fundamental fermions. What I want to look at are massless fundamental fermions, and these are quarks. They may come in several flavors. And therefore, they may have an additional UN, UNF symmetry. I'm going to look at the situation with just one flavor. Okay. So I'm going to look at a single wild fermion. The uh, Hamiltonian for the gauge field. So I'm also looking at fermionic configurations that are constant on S3. So the uh, Hamiltonian for the uh, fermions that couple to this gauge field is made up of these two terms. The lambda dagger lambda term simply comes from the curvature term of S3. And the second term, which is uh, uh, lambda dagger, which is of the form uh, lambda dagger tau sigma lambda multiplying an m, is <coughs> of the form, is basically of the form, is the analog of uh, psi dagger gamma, uh, gamma dot A uh, psi. So this is my Hamiltonian. So this is the Hamiltonian. And, and again, you, you just have to go back and look at the uh, standard matrix model on S3, look at the configurations that are independent of the S3 coordinate, and you'll see that this is the Hamiltonian. Oh, uh, that is there in the Lagrangian. Lambda dot, lambda dagger dot lambda term is there in the Lagrangian. The Hamiltonian, uh, the uh, first order time derivative terms are. Okay. Now, uh, no, uh, because uh, it it doesn't have the same status as a mass because uh, mass mixes the left and right movers. This is uh, even if you take even just left movers, it is just uh, sitting with benign. It's number of it's like the number operator. It is, it is a while fermion. Sorry, maybe you are thinking of something else. Are you? Yes. I am, I am making the, uh, if you like, I am making the most violent approximation. Okay, and seeing how far I can go with this very, very, very crude approximation. Sure, yeah, that's right. It will contribute, just say, it will contribute a number, constant. Okay. So the total Hamiltonian of the theory is the Young Mills Hamiltonian plus this H fermion, that this guy, plus this guy. Young Mills Hamiltonian is the one that I wrote earlier. And if this is a quantum mechanical problem, this is what I want to solve, H psi equal to E psi. And of course, demanding that um, the state be colorless, if you like. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at small g, but rather than do perturbation theory, I'm going to quantize in two steps. I'm going to first treat the gauge field as a fixed background field and quantize the fermion in this background and then quantize the gauge field. And this is the same as uh, Born Oppenheimer. Okay, this is the same as Born Oppenheimer, and you can see that this is a this is uh, this is Born Oppenheimer is the right thing to do here because the g squared multiplies the e squared term, uh, the, the kinetic energy term of the Young Mills, 
It's exactly like how the, when you do born oppenheimer for molecular physics, the uh, grad square term for the, uh, for the nuclei is much, is in, in some heuristic sense, much smaller than the, uh, uh, grade, than the kinetic energy terms for the electron. So this is what we are going to do. So I'm going to treat the uh, uh, gauge field as slow nuclear variables and the fermions as the fast, like the fast electronic variables. So you can, um, uh, you can look at the, what Gauss law means uh, in, what is a, how does Gauss law look like in the Born-Oppenheimer approximation? And I'll have a little, I'll have uh, probably a little bit, <laughs> yes, no. So what, the correct way of, absolutely you're right, the correct way of doing things is to look at what Gauss law means in the Born-Oppenheimer. Yes, 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 that's right. And it, it's very important because it, it carries signatures of anomalies. Yes. Yes. Now there is no more primary constraint which is phi of u of uh, yeah, it is multi. It was multiplying uh, a zero. Right, yeah, right. yeah. Okay. Uh, so, uh, here, I mean, there's no. So there's still a gauge fascination. Like yeah, yeah. So, uh, so we have to. So, I'm going to tell you. Uh, um, yeah, yeah. This is just a global. There is no local form left anymore. So, um, just a brief reminder of uh, the Born-Oppenheimer approximation, and uh, <clears throat> this is what it uh, looks like for our case. The total Hilbert space is made up of the Hilbert space of the slow degrees of freedom tensored with the fast degree of freedom. What we do is first solve this equation. Uh, look for the eigenstates of the fast Hamiltonian. This is this is my me looking for the eigenstates of the fast Hamiltonian. Uh, the basis vectors of the full Hilbert space are of the form uh, uh, that, that are made up of one leg in H slow and the eigenstates, these eigenstates. And I put a tensor product with a tilde just to remind me of the fact that these eigenstates depend on M itself, okay? just to remember that fact. So uh, this expectation value of uh, the electric field operator in this basis is not just the derivative as it, as it normally is. It has, because of, precisely because of it, of the dependence of this leg on M. Instead, what we have to do is we have to derive the mat this matrix element and uh, compute this uh, expectation value to get the effective Ham Hamiltonian for the slow degrees of freedom. Now, um, this, if you, this was the, uh, this was done by uh, Berry in uh, a few years after his first paper on, uh, uh, in the uh, early, mid, mid 80s was the paper on Berry phase. And five years later, when he was asked to contribute to the uh, uh, reprint volume, uh, Berry uh, showed that if you now give dynamics to the, this, to the slow, if you give dynamics to the uh, uh, parameter space, then uh, you have to be careful and you have to rederive the Hamiltonian for the slow dynamics, and uh, this is what you get. <clears throat> so, if you look at it in terms of projection operators, then uh, Berry's calculation gives me that uh, the effective Hamiltonian is simply of this form. The pi the, elect the momentum conjugate to the uh, M uh, now picks up uh, the adiabatic connection. This is an adiabatic connection in the space of M's. Okay? So this is the form that it has. This V is just the um, uh, square of the magnetic field. Okay? It's, a mag it's, it's, the, it's whatever is left over from, uh, uh, from looking at the, uh, the potential of the pure Yang mills. Uh, this E is the eigenstate of the fast Hamiltonian. And phi is an effective, uh, is a, uh, uh, phi is an, sorry, 
effective scalar potential that is that is induced. Uh, you can write down the form for phi. So the the, uh, the Berry connection is just the uh, 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 is just the take the take the uh, 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 take the uh, take the derivative of uh, of uh, of wave functions and then uh, take the derivative if you like and project back to the subspace and phi can be again computed in terms of the projectors and has this, uh, uh, I mean, this is a form which looks complicated, but with time you can learn to like and love. So if there are degeneracies, if E is degenerate, then there is a small modification to this formula. The left hand side is just G0 times phi, where G0 is a degeneracy. Our goal is to compute phi and then put it back in this equation and look at the Look at what it implies for the dynamics of the slow degrees of freedom. Okay. So this phi that uh, I just want to say a few things about about phi. Uh, <clears throat> it has appeared. It appears uh, to be quite versatile, and uh, it appears in many settings. For example, it is related to something called the quantum geometric tensor. It's a real part of the quantum geometric tensor. The imaginary part of the quantum geometric tensor is actually just a curvature, Berry's curvature. This, uh, uh, this G, is a, the real part is a Riemannian metric and it measures the distance between pure states corresponding to projectors uh, at uh, uh, position x and position x plus dx. For uh, adiabatic evolution, this is a measure of operator fidelity. So it tells you the uh, how close you are, how close the adiabatic Hamiltonian is to the true Hamiltonian. And uh, this phi, in condensed matter at least, some people use it to hunt for quantum phase transitions. Because the, well, at least what they tell me is that the standard landau ginzburg paradigm doesn't always uh, help you in finding quantum phase transitions. So they look for singularities of phi to try to locate positions of quantum phase transitions. Okay. So what I'm going to do in the next seven minutes is quickly compute phi. The idea is very simple. You look at, I look at the one fermion states. They're of the form uh, lambda dagger acting on the vacuum uh, multiplied by coefficients that depend on the gauge field. I put it back in the fermion Hamiltonian. You get an equation like this. You get a very simple uh, eigenvalue equation. H acting on C is E acting on E times C. So I want to investigate the nature of the eigenvalues of this. So in other words, I want to find the, <coughs> I want to solve this. This is very simple. This is just a 4 by 4 matrix because the tau's are 2 by 2, sigma's are 2 by 2. The 4 by 4 matrix that depends on M. <coughs> so you, uh, you can, uh, with a little bit of work, you can write down the characteristic equation fourth order polynomial, there is no, uh, is linear in M, is linear in M. That's right, because it is, uh, yeah, it's just, uh, yeah, that's right. So the characteristic equation is a fourth order polynomial and uh, you can uh, write it in these convenient coordinates, G, uh, convenient uh, variables, G and H, which I've defined like this. Okay. Now, <coughs> since uh, H is, Manifestly, it's a 4 by 4 matrix. Just by inspection, it is Hermitian. It can have only real roots. What this means is that this characteristic polynomial <coughs> must have only real roots. Uh, and one of the conditions that it has only real roots is that the discriminant must be non-negative. There are other conditions too. But in this case, one of this, this, is a, this is one of the conditions. And if you compute the discriminant, we find this rather unexpected identity that all three by three matrices have to satisfy. Now, if I, since I, because of the way I motivated the identity, it's hardly a surprise. But if I just presented this to you and said, would you believe it? You would have nothing to say, you would. <laughs> 729. <laughs> Uh, no, I kept the 729 because I think that this equation, this is the, in terms of G and H. So uh, the, uh, 
The first thing that we found is that we find a crazy identity that is obeyed by all 3 by 3 real matrices. Um, can I answer it after 5 minutes? Okay. So in the G, so, so in other words, any 3 by 3 matrix lies in this plane, in, 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 lies inside this shaded region which I have drawn in the GH plane. So an arbitrary 3 by 3 matrix is either inside the bulk or along the edges or at the corners. These are, this is the characterization of all 3 by 3 real matrices. Oh, so what I did is I, this is the discriminant uh, in variables G and H. So I put uh, G on the X axis and H on the Y axis. Okay, and then the, the, this uh, labeling is wrong y axis is h. So that is this inequality, that is inequality. So this is the set of all possible 3 by 3 matrices. So at the top corner, so uh, what is interesting is that the, this is intimately related to the structure of degeneracies of the, uh, of the uh, fermions. The fermi so for example, in the bulk, the, uh, uh, it's completely non-degenerate. You have four eigenvalues. At the top corner, you have uh, the structure of degeneracies is 2 and 2. At the two corners at the bottom, this one and at what I call C and degeneracy structure is, there is there's a triplet and a singlet. All 3 by 3 real matrices. Then it will rise, uh, but why would you be interested in Hermitian 3 by 3? Oh, no, M's are the, the Hamiltonian, Hamiltonian is Hermitian, M's are, uh, M's are arbitrary 3 by 3 matrices. So they all lie here. So, this identity. Which identity? This one. Yeah. So here you see that it involves only determinant, uh, objects like the determinant and trace M transpose M and then uh, and M transpose M, M transpose M, things like that. M, yes. So M transpose M you can diagonalize, but not M itself. Yes. So uh, this is what the spectrum looks like, the spectrum of wild fermions. So there is, it's like a, uh, some, like the cross section of the wing of an aeroplane perhaps. Okay. But uh, actually it turns out that the theory with a single, if I have just a single wild fermion, then it has the gauge anomaly, Witten's SU2 gauge anomaly. So the physical theory has to have at least two fermions, either both of the same chirality or, or of opposite chirality. So what we did is we took the situation, one with uh, the same chirality and the other with opposite chirality and we computed the effective potential. It's a long, it's a somewhat long calculation but what we, what we saw, what we show is that the, <clears throat> whenever the degeneracy of the ground state changes, then the effective potential diverges. So for example, here, if you are here, then the ground state is triply degenerate. But if you move away from here, if you go to the bulk, then the ground state becomes non-degenerate. If you move from here to either this line or this line, again the degeneracy of the ground state changes. So whenever the degeneracy of the ground state changes, the effective potential uh, has effective potential diverges. We also found that the fundamental fermion is more sensitive than the adjoint fermion in the sense that, um, in the sense that I can tell you later perhaps. For example, the fundamental fermion can distinguish when only two of the singular values coincide, whereas the adjoint fermion cannot distinguish between these two things. And the I, edges and corners are places where the fermion eigenmodes uh, condense or where, the, where they become degenerate. 
So <clears throat> the question is, can we interpret this as phases of the Angmills Dirac theory? So this is a picture of uh, the two fermion state. And uh, this is what the uh, spectrum looks like of, for two wild fermions of the same chirality. So inside, in the bulk, we have six states. They're all non-degenerate. At the corners A, the ground state remains non-degenerate. Um, uh, and so on. So you can see that, for example, along BC, the ground state remains doubly degenerate. Uh, at the corner B or at the corner C. The B and C are these corners. So B and C are the corners, uh, these. So at that, the ground state degeneracy is 3. If you, okay. <clears throat> so uh, you can write down the characteristic polynomial for the uh, two fermion problem, and it, with some work, you can compute the effective potential. <clears throat> what uh, this effective potential, uh, if you examine the, what happens to the effective potential as you approach one of the, any of the corners, for example, if you uh, approach uh, the edge BC, <clears throat> or if you, um, uh, or, or if you approach the corner B, then uh, this is the form that the effective potential takes. And uh, just by the properties of the roots, this, the root uh, approaches minus 1 as you approach the edge. This effective potential blows up. So you <coughs> uh, now what, what is, what, what is uh, the real reason why we think of these as phases is because there is also an independent way of computing the scalar potential directly. You start off with the, with the situation where you have the degeneracy and you put it into the formula. And then it turns out that the effective potential is well defined. For example, the effective potential that you compute in the bulk is singular as you approach the corner. But you can compute the effective potential by sitting at the corner itself. And it's completely well defined. So, <clears throat> What it means is that for the dynamics of the slow degrees of freedom, the Hilbert space has split into three distinct regions. One is the bulk, where the dynamics is governed by this uh, phi bulk, and it diverges as you approach either the corner B or BC. The other is this edge BC, where the dynamics is governed by phi 2 edge, which you can compute independently and is perfectly well defined on the edge. But the phi edge itself diverges as you approach the corner B. And finally, at the corner B, where again you can compute the effective potential, and uh, uh, the dynamics is governed by that. So this effective potential, if you like, is not analytic in this full region ABC. Uh, this is what the pictures, the pictures look like. So, <clears throat> so at least for the case of uh, SU2 gauge theory, there are three distinct uh, regions or phases. Now, why, the reason why this divergence is important is because if you want to discuss states of finite energy, then you have to have wave functions that vanish as you approach the corner, those corners. So if you are in the bulk, then you will demand that the wave functions from the bulk vanish as you approach one of the corners. But you can compute, you can directly compute the quantum theory on the edge or at the corner. And uh, <clears throat> that means that uh, there is, there are, the Hilbert space has broken up into super selection sectors. And the states in one phase cannot be obtained as wave functions from another phase. So <clears throat> at the corner, and uh, this has to do with the uh, question about Gauss law that uh, Rajesh asked, you can show that uh, the gauge symmetry is actually broken. And at the corner B, what, you can, what we uh, see is that there is a locking between the spin degrees of freedom and the color degrees of freedom. So this is this color spin rotation, which was identified by Thomas Schaeffer for QCD with one flavor. So it, he did it for QCD, which is for SU3. Here we find that it, is, it happens for a two flavor, uh, two color QCD with one flavor also. No, no. It was, it, it was just, uh, I mean, he, he, study, he, all, he did study situations where there were, in, the, in that paper, he also looked at what happens when there is chemical potential. Uh, 
Uh, yeah, so, um, so here, uh, if you like, the chemical potential is, uh, 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 the memory of the chemical potential is there in the fact that the fermion number is non-zero. It's only when the fermions are turned on that you see uh, this color flavor locking phase. It's not there in pure Yang mills. In the, in, the, in the quantum mechanical model, it, um, we just have states, no? If we don't have, yeah. So we can compute that and, yes, yes, that's right. So, well, if we have a stronger statement. We find that uh, the fermionic Hamiltonian actually commutes with a particular uh, combination of a color plus flavor, a color plus spin. It actually commutes. Normally, the fermionic Hamiltonian should transform under gauge transformations or under rotations. Here, for this at the corner, it actually commutes. No, we have not integrated over that. Maybe I, uh, maybe you can. Uh, uh, so, at, so in this quantum mechanical model, this corner corresponds to uh, all three singular values being equal. If you like, that is a diagnostic. So, the M is of the form So for M of this form, if you look at the fermion Hamiltonian, then uh, there is now an enhanced symmetry. And yes, yeah, and and A and A should not be zero. Yes, that's right. Okay, uh, so let, uh, you can do that for the Dirac fermion also, which is basically adding. Uh, left chirality and right chirality. The, uh, the details change, but the basic picture remains the same, which is that whenever the degeneracy of the ground state changes, the corresponding effective potential blows up. So for the case of Dirac fermion, you can look at the scalar potential. It blows up along these, uh, along, the, along the two sides, rather than along the curvy side, as it was for the And, uh, um, okay. For the case of Dirac fermion, it turns out that, that there are four distinct phases. Again, one of these phases is the uh, color spin locked phase, which corresponds to the life at corner B or C. Okay. So I just want to summarize here because I'm um, many, many minutes over time. Uh, the effective potential induced by the fermions has an interesting singularity structure that is suggestive of quantum phases. This uh, singularities arise Whenever the uh, whenever two of the fermion eigenvalues collide, so you could, if you like, want to think of it as eigenvalue repulsion. These uh, SUN models, which uh, the kind of thing that Spenta was asking about, these are amenable to large end concept computations, and we have only very preliminary results for them. Uh, what we are really interested in is looking at uh, the same analysis, but for QCD, which is for SU3 coupled to one, two, and three flavors. Uh, and uh, we can also, with a little bit of, uh, with a lot, much more work, uh, apply the same uh, kind of uh, technology, same idea, to supersymmetric angle theories. And some work is in progress with my student, Mohul, and my sort of de facto student, Veronica. The student I share with Keshav in Haskell. So uh, this work uh, is based on a paper that I uh, wrote with Mohul last month, and it's uh, uh, earlier work, matrix model is based on two papers that I wrote with Balachandran and Amil Khan here. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, the chair has to decide the order. <laughs>
the dimension of dimension of space. So uh, this matrix model was reduced on S3 cross R. I don't know how to do this on S2. I do not know how to do this particular reduction on S2. S2 cross S1 cross R or S2 cross R. I'm saying suppose you're doing three-dimensional gaze theory. Yes. Plus one. Yes. Four-dimensional yeah. gaze theory. Yeah. Is that difficult for zero modes? Um, uh, maybe, one, maybe one could try. One could try. I have not tried it. But uh, uh, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. No, that is the remnant. That's right. That is the memory of the spatial uh, uh, of of three dimensional space. So, uh, so I I don't know whether you can do it. And yeah, if somebody could try it. Yeah. Sorry, that's a comment or a question? Yes, yes, I know. But in terms, in the context of this talk, is it a comment or a question? No, the, oh, sorry, one more, the fermion degeneracy. This is for Dirac, you want Dirac or? Uh, uh, I think the fermion degeneracy is in one of those things. Um, okay, never mind, but uh, at the points where the fermions have degeneracies, yes. normally expect that the bond of Mohammed approximation doesn't work in it. Right? Absolutely, so in fact, this is the, um, this is um, Berry's original observation. So uh, what he said is that this effective potential that uh, the uh, slow degrees of freedom C blows up whenever the, uh, at places where the degeneracy of the fermion changes. And he therefore interpreted this as saying that this is in fact making the von Oppenheim approximation better because it is telling you to stay away from places where, because uh, where, uh, when the degeneracy is, uh, when the, energy levels of the fermions come closer, then uh, it becomes moot as to how valid the bond of the effective potential pushes you away from those regions. In the case of, uh, in the standard example of a particle in a magnetic field, what uh, Berry showed is that in, in addition to the, uh, in addition to the monopole connection, this, uh, there is also this effective potential and that goes like um, uh, one by mod R square. What it goes. Just the next thing is a comment. If you look at that identity that you have, right? That, uh, yeah. So if you prove it for diagonalized, diagonalizable matrices, yes, that's good enough because any matrix can be built. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. 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 No, but I'm saying that the strong statement that you do it for any diagonalizable matrix. Yeah. Give you a set of diagonalized. Yeah, that's a, it's dense. Yeah. Um, uh, it's true. The thing is only, uh, I mean, one has to think this proof through because when you say it is dense, uh, this is a nonlinear relation. Uh, so, um, uh, you, are, you may be right, but I have to think this through in my head. So, so there is only det m squared. M transpose and m is, you can rewrite it as an identity for m transpose yes, m, yes. which is an arbitrary symmetric yes. matrix. Yes. So then you can, uh, yes. this is for any. Yes. Do you know what is the difference between getting what is the m transpose and the transpose? I, I mean. <laughs> but then it becomes obvious. <laughs> no, I, I, uh, it was not obvious to us. So you stare at it and. Uh, so in this way, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That four real numbers makes a. Yeah. Yeah, so if you couple the, uh, if you look at the adjoint fermion and do the same thing, then you get a, uh, uh, the uh, eigenvalue equation for the adjoint fermion is the square of a cubic. It's 
a sixth order polynomial, but can be thought of as a square of a cubic. There uh, we got this identity. Trace of something like this. And this is a subset. This is a subset of this identity. Is this right, Mohal? Or there is a further square? Huh? Yeah, let me fix the identity. Is there a further square? No. Ah, oh, thank you. Yes. This is it. Yes, yes. I, I mean, you can write it in terms of singular. Yeah. For 3 by 3, it is, um, uh, so we tried it for 3 by 3. The proof is not obvious. You are, uh, Uh, it could be, but this is a cheap way of generating uh, strange identities for real matrices. Okay, uh, <laughs> probably we should wrap up because we have already over time. Uh, you know, we can have. <laughs> So the dimension of the fermion Hilbert space is just uh, is a fermionic Hamiltonian just four by four. So it is four. It's a four. But the dimension of the full Hilbert space is infinite dimensional. And uh, if if I was just playing around with four by four matrices, there are no phase transitions. There is no there are no super selection sections because it is it is uh, stitched with the um, uh, wave function for the M for the gluon. That, that, that the full wave function is infinite dimensional and then there you have issues about domains of unbounded operators. For example, the operators that I talked about are unbounded operators. So then domains have to be defined carefully. And, uh, the anomaly that I talked about is because uh, when you do a, a particular kind of gauge transformation, the domain of the Hamiltonian changes. So because the domain of the Hamiltonian changes, uh, those are what those kinds of transformations can be thought of.